When I first tried Flutter a few years ago when it was in beta, I instantly loved it because it made mobile app development so much faster. But nowadays in 2023, Flutter development is like 10 times faster than it was thanks to visual editing magic. Would you like to see a magic trick? In today's video, I'll show you exactly how I'm building my own native iOS and Android apps, but instead of writing all the code by hand like I've always done in the past, I fully embrace the productivity boost of a visual editor called Flutter Flow, the sponsor of today's video. But please don't tell them I would have made this video for free because the product is really that good. And as you may know, I'm always highly skeptical of low-code tools. Because they often produce garbage code, then you hit a brick wall when you need something custom. But that's not the case with Flutter Flow. In the next five minutes, we'll build a full-stack mobile app that handles user authentication along with real-time data in Firestore. When you first sign up, it has a demo app, so let's first do a quick tour of the most important features. A Flutter app is structured as a tree of widgets. In the middle, we have our canvas where we can traverse these widgets. Flutter provides a bunch of built-in widgets that we can actually just grab here from the sidebar, then drag and drop them into the UI visually. Then, once you have a widget selected, you can go to the right side and update its properties, like alignment, padding, color, shadows, background images, and all kinds of other stuff. That's a huge productivity boost right there, but many widgets need to be interactive. For that, we can go to the Actions tab and then choose an event, like on Double Tap, that will run some code when this event is fired. We might navigate to another page, close a dialog, or even make a call to Firestore or some other API. We can also easily add animations when actions are triggered. On top of that, we can document each widget, which will insert a comment into the code. And speaking of the code, we can view it by clicking this code button up here. That'll take us to the code view, where we can view the source code for an entire page, or we can click on an individual widget to highlight just that code. And as an experienced Flutter developer, I feel like I understand what this code does. But one of the more complicated aspects of development is state management. On the sidebar here, we have our app state, which allows you to organize global state that can be used anywhere in the application. In addition, we can make this state persisted, which will store it on device between sessions. We can use it in the application, like by setting it as the text field on the button. Then from there, we can create an action to update the state and have the entire application react to it. But you don't want all data to be global. If we click on the widget tree here in the sidebar, you'll notice that we can select every page in the application. Pages are special because they can be navigated to with the router, but they also have the option to have their own state. You'll notice a state management button here on the right where we can add stateful variables to it. That's cool, but you might also have individual widgets that have their own local state. As the widget tree grows more complex, you'll want to break it down into your own custom components that can be reused. You can do that by selecting a point in the widget tree, then right-click and convert to component, or just click on the diamond icon. What's awesome is that you can now edit this component in isolation, and it can define its own local state. It's all very logical, and you don't need to think about implementing some complex state management system. If we look at the code, it generates a model file for the data itself, then uses built-in Flutter primitives like setState to update this data in the application. Now, the next thing I want to show you is the theme editor. From this panel, we can customize the design system, like responsive breakpoints, colors, and typography. And you can also manage custom fonts and icons here as well. All the features I've showed you up until this point will likely take care of 90% of your UI and state management needs. However, at some point, you'll likely need to write custom code. Like maybe you have a widget you want to reuse from a different project, or maybe you just have some custom Dart function that does some fancy math. The custom code panel allows you to write that code and then apply it in the application visually. Oh, and what do we have here, an open AI panel that can write this code for you. This thing is ridiculously overpowered. And if that weren't enough, we can also write unit tests for this code visually to make sure that we're actually getting valid code. There's a ton of other features we could talk about here, but now I want to take you behind the scenes and show you how I'm using it to build a native mobile app for Fireship Pro members. The Fireship website uses Firebase as the back end. And one thing that's especially awesome about Flutter Flow is that it integrates with Firebase as well as Supabase out of the box. When you create a new project, you can actually just give it your Firebase project ID and add Flutter Flow as an editor to your project, and it will automatically generate all of your config files as well as Firebase rules and things like that. It eliminates a lot of tedious configuration work. Now once you have the project set up, you can actually create a schema for your data in Firestore, and this allows you to use that data model anywhere in the Flutter app. On top of that, it even has a schema validation tool to make sure that the schema actually matches up with the data in the database. Now if you're not using Firebase, you can also make API calls and then use JSON path as a query language. For example, if you have an existing Next.js app with API routes, you could call those API routes to bring in data to your Flutter app, or any other API for that matter. But here's where things start to get really cool. As you can see here, I have a login page to use the application. We've got multiple sign-in methods, and usually that's a lot of work to get all coded up, because normally you would log in, create a document in Firestore for that user, and then navigate to the appropriate screen. Well, we can actually handle that entire process without writing any code. If we click on a button, and then go to the Actions, it'll take us to the Action Flow Editor. In this case, we want to implement Google sign-in 
in. So we just choose the Google Auth provider and we're done. In many cases though, you may also want to create a document in Firestore when the user signs up. We can do that automatically by checking the box for create collection. But once the user is authenticated, we then need to navigate to a page. We can handle that by adding a second action to this flow. We'll tell it to navigate to our profile page, and we can even throw in a sliding animation here if we want. But what if the logic here is even more complex? Like maybe we want to do one thing for pro members, and do something entirely different for non-pro members. We can handle that by adding a condition. Now that the user is authenticated, we have access to the state of the user, and we can branch off our workflow based on whether or not that user is a pro member. From there, each user could be navigated to a different screen, or we could even add additional backend calls here to one of the API routes or to Firestore to create a new document. And that's all it takes to log in a user with complex backend logic. Oh, and one other thing I want to point out here is that the actual UI for the sign-in buttons was not designed by me personally, but came from one of Flutterflow's built-in templates. You can just drag these right into the canvas and tweak their settings. And if you're building multiple Flutter apps, you can create what are called theme widgets to reuse your own widgets across multiple projects. And that's a huge feature if you run an agency that creates apps for other people. In any case, when a user logs in as a pro member, I want to take them to a profile page that shows their pro status, as well as their total experience points. You might be wondering though, how and where do we fetch this data? Well, you can handle data fetching at any point in the widget tree, but in this case, we'll do it at the page level. When we click on the page widget, we can then find the button for backend query, which allows us to create a query that can either grab a single document from Firestore, a collection from Firestore, or make an API call to some other service. In this case, we just want to fetch a single document from the user's collection that's linked to the currently logged in user. By default, it will use Firebase real-time features to update the document whenever a change is made, although you can change that behavior by making it a one-time query. And now that we have that data, we can start using it throughout the application. All the values in brackets, like pro stat, display name, and total XP are based on the Firestore schema that we set up earlier. If you're wondering how that works, we can look at the code and see here that it has a stream builder wrapped around the entire page. And that's the exact way I would set it up if I were doing it myself in the code. But now let's go to the achievements page, which makes a query to a Firestore collection. It's the same basic process, but we can do additional things here like filtering and ordering on the Firestore query. One thing I find extra cool here is that you'll notice we have four different elements in the list, and that's because it auto-populates those to give you a preview of what it should look like when you fetch your data. But now let's assume we're ready to run our application and then deploy it to the app stores. The first thing we can do is click on the eyeball to go into preview mode. In preview mode, it won't actually fetch your data, but things like navigation will work so you can get the general idea of how things are looking on a variety of different devices. Now to actually run the app, we can click on the lightning bolt to test it in the browser. This works pretty well, but not all features are supported in the browser, like the device camera, vibration, and stuff like that. Another option is to download the actual code and run it locally in Android Studio or Xcode. And when it comes to Android, you can actually build and download the APK directly. This is a paid feature, but if you're serious about deploying a native app, it's money well spent. And if you go to the settings tab, it integrates with CodeMagic for one-click deployment to the app stores. But even if you're not serious, the free tier is a great way to get things built quickly, and also just a great way to learn Flutter to see how different patterns can be implemented. The reason I'm using it to build my app, though, is because it writes code that I understand and like, and just eliminates a ridiculous amount of friction. Like, I didn't even talk about push notifications, app permissions or multilingual support, all of which can also be handled by Flutter Flow. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one.